<laughs> okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jake Spiegler, and I'd like to welcome you to our 11th Plan at Casey Webinar. I'm a graduate student in the master's program here at Penn State, and will be one of your event facilitators this year. The CAM at KSU webinars are an open forum for anyone engaged or interested in knowledge science and knowledge sciences. In this community, we define knowledge science broadly and inclusively. Events and webinars are offered to expand the dialogue and also to provide exposure to people and organizations who are doing great things to advance ideas and to discuss challenges. We want this to be your forum. So we encourage you to propose events, suggest topics, events, as we mentioned in our kickoff session, are not limited presentations, but can also be conversations and discussions interviews, and so on. We have received many very interesting suggestions over the last few months, and we are always looking for volunteers for future sessions. This is an open forum which operates under a Creative Commons governance model. It is also a community without formal funding, so I want to always take the time to acknowledge the contributions of our team here at Penn State, including Janet Gransko, our academic program coordinator, Cole Stempak, another of our, one of our graduate assistants, and Denise Bedford, our Goodyear Professor of Knowledge Management, who happens to be our speaker today. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to her. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Jake, for the introduction. Um, today I wanted to talk about um, a topic that has been discussed in some aspects of the intellectual capital uh, discipline, but not necessarily very widely in the knowledge management field. <clears throat> and that is knowledge cities and how they contribute to a knowledge society. So today I'd like to talk about five different, actually we've got six different um, components to the presentation. First is just a quick uh, reference to what we call the systems context in knowledge management. Then I'd like to briefly discuss the two perspectives on the knowledge economy. We'll also look at some of the historical perspectives on knowledge cities, and perhaps I'll be able to convince you that we need a new perspective on what a knowledge city is. And we'll then present our view of what that 21st century view of a knowledge city looks like. We'll talk about how we get from where we are today to that view of the 21st century knowledge city, and then I'd like to just introduce the idea of knowledge extension services and how they might help us to um, achieve our goal. So let's start out with um, a, a discussion, or at least a, a quick reference to the systems context. So I think we'd all agree that systems thinking is a cornerstone of knowledge management. We have two major thought leaders, probably many more, um, who who have addressed the topic of systems thinking. Peter Senge. Also, Edward Deming um, has uh, discussed this. Deming is a little bit of, of an older um, thought leader coming out of the 60s and the 70s and coming primarily from the management or engineering field, but still a very important contributor. So systems thinking involves seeing the whole as more than the sum of its components or parts and understanding the relationship of each component to the health of the whole system. So both Senge and Deming's theories of systems thinking have been applied to what I would call bounded entities, such as organizations, to corporations, and to parts of cities, but not necessarily to a city as an entity. So my research suggests that these theories um, all of the foundational ideas of systems thinking are applicable with equally good results to cities. So if we model cities as systems, this aligns with the new thinking about the knowledge economy and the role that knowledge cities play in that economy. So in the past two years, I've been doing research into how we represent and grow a knowledge economy. The starting point for my research about two years ago was an attempt to use the World Bank's country-focused knowledge economy index to measure a state's progress towards a knowledge economy. As I worked through the research methodology, I realized that my starting model was flawed. In fact, the knowledge economy index actually did not focus on a knowledge economy, 
but it measured a country's progress towards an advanced industrial economy. So my research then took an entirely different path. I had to step back and build out an entirely new model of a knowledge society, including all the factors that describe the civic context, the social structure, the economic system, the natural and built environment, and the human development context. So let me tell you a little bit about these two different perspectives on the knowledge economy. When I actually discovered that my original theory was flawed, it was quite a shock. So um, I think it's, you can imagine um, the amount of sort of reorientation it took me to come up with an entirely new view on a knowledge economy in depth. So from an economist's perspective, cities create what we call agglomeration and network effects. They create opportunities for economies of scale that derive from sector concentrations. So wherever there is a concentration of organizations all serving a particular economic sector or industry, stocks of domain knowledge or intellectual capital may lead to innovation or market efficiencies. So this perspective tends to focus on cities in the context of a country or a regional economic system. But cities are actually lower level sources that contribute intellectual capital to the country or region's overall economic value and are valued within the national system of accounts. So these are some images of traditional knowledge cities. The, um, the one thing that all of these images conveyed to me when I started looking around for models of knowledge cities was their heavy, heavy focus on technology and a modern um, uh, engineered environment. So if we look at the World Bank's Knowledge Economy Index, um, we find um, several different uh, pillars. Um, the, we, look, we see the economic incentive regime, the innovation re regime, essentially the business environment. So this is the methodology that I try to apply at the state level in terms of uh, looking at building a knowledge economy index for the state of Ohio. So the second perspective is that of actually a knowledge scientist. What we were just looking at is the perspective from, of an economist. So this, the perspective of a knowledge scientist is actually more of a microeconomic view. So from a knowledge scientist perspective, cities are aggregations of intellectual capital produced by individuals in the form of human capital, produced by households, communities, and organizations in the form of structural capital, and by transactions and activities in the form of relational capital. And you'll see, you'll probably hear a little bit of Daniel Andreessen in that description. Okay. So knowledge scientists explore those factors that promote and sustain knowledge cities as complex, adaptive and dynamic systems constructed around knowledge transactions. If we look at the, if we look back at the economist view, the macroeconomic view, we don't actually see anything that resembles a knowledge transaction. We see outputs or outcomes that may have something to do with knowledge, but we actually can't tie anything directly to a knowledge transaction. So knowledge scientists are concerned with the transformation of cities into knowledge cities. So when I had to go back and rethink what we meant by a knowledge economy, I had to identify those systems that essentially support a knowledge economy, which would include the economic system, the societal regime, the civic context, human development, and the environment context. So all of these are critical for creating a knowledge economy and a knowledge society. Remember that a knowledge economy exists within a knowledge society. So what we had to do was to step back into each of those five um, systems and come up with essentially indicators that were more reflective of knowledge transactions. So we might look at the community culture, the density of the labor market, the abundance of jobs, 
knowledge-related jobs in particular. We would look at entrepreneurial activities, the amount of home ownership, or the level of home ownership, inner city co-authorship, um, co-authorship um, of folks in the city with international um, partners, job creation for individuals who are over 50. We're also looking at the nature of local economic impacts, not necessarily state, national, or international. Oh, let me speak a little bit louder. My apologies. We also might look at low-cost access to advanced co communication networks. We can um, identify the fact that there are communication networks available to people, but if they're not affordable, you're not going to see many knowledge transactions across them. We can look at the ratio of female to male um, earnings. We can look at research activities that are in proximity to the city. And we can also look at the level of unemployment in a city. All of these indicators are uh, characteristic of where knowledge transactions may or may not be happening. In the civic context, we looked at the number of distinct individuals serving in an official capacity. We might look at knowledge-based agencies within the city government, not just the number of cities, uh, of agencies, excuse me, but whether or not those agencies are actually behaving um, in a knowledge uh, way. In other words, how many knowledge transactions are there between the city government and the citizenry? We're also looking perhaps at knowledge-rich city-level portals and communications with citizens. The number of civic activities and meetings, in other words, how many civic organizations are there? How open are there? How open are they? And how often do they meet? We're also looking at the number of non- and not-for-profit organizations. These are other ways to engage citizens um, or community members in knowledge transactions. We're also looking at the level of political expression and security, the degree of political stability, in other words, elections, recalls, peaceful changes. We're looking at the strategic development uh, planning effort of the city, which would ideally include citizens in that effort. Does the city have a strategic vision? And what is the level of trust in government? In terms of the societal regime, we might look at the uh, business ethics and uh, the compliance with business ethics, citizen-to-citizen -citizen interactions with other cities, citizen-to-citizen um, -citizen interactions within the city. One of the effects of our very um, heavily networked society today is that we may be talking to people who live three cities away and yet not engaging in conversation with the people who are standing next to us on the sidewalk. How many clubs and associations are open to citizens? What is the level of, is, of investment of business in social activities? One of the things we might recall is that in our cities in the early 20th century, we had a lot of investment by business in um, the, the societal um, context. In other words, businesses would invest in um, activities in the city. We might look also at the number of languages that are spoken in the community. Are there open meeting places for citizens? Uh, what are the organizational communication indicators? Because the businesses and organizations that um, exist in a community affect the culture of the community as well. What are the organizational culture indicators of the city? How does the city maintain its organizational member? What is the rate of arriving and departing citizens? In other words, the the, the brain uh, the um, the brain drain or the brain gain. In terms of environment, um, I think the environment is also a very important aspect of a knowledge city. If the environment is is strong and productive, it's more likely that you're going to have individuals in the city engaging in knowledge transactions with one another because they're more comfortable being out in the environment. So we might look at the number of abandoned industrial sites and brownfields, access to potable water, 
the average age of buildings in a city. In other words, the age of, of this, and also the age of the city's biodiversity richness. We would also look at community environmental activities, recycling, cleanup, etc. Um, I have the good fortune to live in one of the counties in the country that is probably the most knowledge rich. Uh, I live in Montgomery County, Maryland, and if I, when I realized I had to stop and redefine the knowledge economy index indicators, I stepped back to think about what it was about my own environment that was conducive to knowledge transactions. And I realized that even something as simple as a 30, Thursday morning recycling activity brought neighbors out to the curb to talk to one another. We have neighborhood cleanup days. Um, we pull together people who will um, identify an area of pollution that we need, maybe need to just organize um, a group of people in the county to go and address. Also, the, the uh, crisis management activities, how does a community pull together and share knowledge in a crisis situation? Emissions control capacity, um, there are some cities that I have traveled to in the country where I do not want to go outside because the level of pollution is so high. So that's not necessarily going to provide me with opportunities to talk to people, to um, have uh, knowledge exchanges. And I think um, also just general environmental pollution levels. So when I work through the new knowledge economy index that I came up with, which included about 99 new indicators. I realized that I couldn't start at the national or the state level and work down. I realized that the indicators that really demonstrated knowledge transactions were at the individual household level, the community organizational level, corporate Score, uh, corporate level or the local government level. So the design that I came up with for a knowledge economy index actually started at those individual levels. So we developed um, scorecards for each of those stakeholders. The intent is that the individual dashboards or scorecards may be aggregated to comprise a composite city index. And we're working on that um, aspect of the index at this point. It seems to me that the only way that you can really demonstrate the, um, the readiness of a city or the level of uh, 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 preparedness to move into a knowledge economy or the progress towards the knowledge economy is from the individual neighborhood or household level up that you can't do this from the national or the state level down. The national and the state level are very important for a policy perspective, but not necessarily for measuring the level of transactions. Okay, so given that um, different mental model that I had to come up with, I went back and looked at some of the historical perspectives on knowledge cities. So are we ready to really um, move into a, a knowledge economy at the city level based on knowledge transactions. And my conclusion was probably not. We need to rethink a little bit of this. We need to change how we think about knowledge cities. Knowledge cities, for most of you who are, who are familiar with this concept, are not a new idea. So a historical review of the literature finds discussions of different kinds of knowledge cities. So the characterization of cities as places, as environments, as social, political, and economic entities was sufficient for an industrial area, era, but it's not sufficient for a knowledge era. So as Agar suggests, cities are far more than physical containers storing people, goods, and knowledge. So one of the first characterization of a knowledge city was a science city. Science cities were constructed to support people who were engaged in scientific or high technology projects in specific time frames and to achieve specific outputs. These cities were largely created from scratch with people imported to the communities. 
They were targeted experiments. They targeted the knowledge-rich professions and highly educated classes, but they were isolated. The essential structure and the functioning of the city was consistent with the industrial economy. So in fact, these cities lacked essential elements of a 21st century knowledge city. There was no heritage. Culture was not, had not, uh, there was not a historical culture. There were no historic cityscapes and, or infrastructures. There was really no pride of place. There were no, we were missing multi-general, multi-generational social systems. We didn't necessarily have multicultural households. And uh, we didn't have an infrastructure that was in harmony with the environment. So Deborah Amidon has done, I think, a really good job of describing the evolution of knowledge cities. Um, she begins in the 1980s with the government, industry, and academe techno interaction. She then looks at science and technology parks, moves on to knowledge clusters and collaboratories, which she characterizes as digital cities. And then in the 21st century to knowledge villages, cities, regions in the world, which she called knowledge zones. Okay. So at one, um, in the early um, characterization of her timeline, she talks about essentially technopolis. So technopolis were targeted experiments in that they focused on incubators or hubs for invention, learning, and collaboration. These were within existing cities. They targeted the same high-skilled and highly educated segments of the population, this time focusing largely on engineering and technology sectors. Like science cities, such as, say, Los Alamos, Oak Ridge, um, China Lake in California, technopolis did not lead to the development of a knowledge city. Instead, they produced technology corridors or technology hubs, generally promoting economic growth for an existing economic sector. But they didn't necessarily um, address the knowledge growth and knowledge transactions of the entire city. So technopolis more closely resemble our idea of a knowledge city in that cities in which they were embedded generally had rich heritage, cultural systems, social and civic systems. So they were an advance over the early science cities. Digital cities, as their name suggests, were laboratories or groups of experts brought together to address a specific problem or to support a project. These um, kinds of knowledge cities have similarities to, similarities to the earlier science cities um, without the isolation and the need to construct a new cityscape to support the collaboration. To some extent, we might say that knowledge clusters or collaboratories contributed to a regression from the idea of a knowledge city because they entirely removed the context of the city from the vision. So it may be that in hindsight, we'll find that we increase the digital and the knowledge divide by creating these kinds of digital laboratories. So there are some common elements across these three representations of knowledge cities, including their focus on work as the main activity, in other words, scientific exploration, discovery, invention, rather than everyday activities in a knowledge city. The fact that they relegated the essential functions and characteristics of the city in other words, the support for human activity, to a minor or non-existent role. Also, the fact that they focused on a small segment of the city's population, specifically those with high academic credentials, and their dependence upon technology support for the community. So what is different about a knowledge village um, is that they take as a starting point a city and a focus on knowledge-rich transactions amongst the whole population of the city. So what is different about a knowledge village is that everyone who lives in the village is considered to be a part of the city system. All of the inhabitants of a city are engaged in knowledge transactions and activities. By focusing on people and knowledge activities, we can see a knowledge city as a complex, continuously adaptive and chaotic system. So this is a radical shift in our thinking, and it requires a major transformation in behavior for everyone who lives in that knowledge city. So what are some of the characteristics of the 21st century knowledge city? Well, it 
as we said, it revolves around the people who live in the city. It focuses not just um, on highly skilled or highly educated people, but all of the people who live in a city. For example, this morning I had a challenge with my car. And um, I worked through my network to identify um, a really good mechanic and automotive shop. And luckily I used my relational capital to identify probably one of the sharpest people in town who was able to look at my problem and literally fix it within about five minutes. Without the knowledge of that mechanic, um, anything else I would, would have done for the, say the next three days um, would have essentially have to, be, have to have been put on hold. A knowledge city relies on all kinds of knowledge and all kinds of expert knowledge. So um, it's we're, one of the characteristics of a knowledge city is not necessarily infrastructure, not the power grid, not the transportation system or the built environment. So it's really an expanded application of both Senge's and Deming's thinking of systems and Deming's system in particular of profound knowledge. And I think um, we can see a lot of Senge in um, just in our everyday interactions um, if we think of a knowledge city in this way. Um, I've been doing a little work looking back at Deming's um, ideas. So I'll talk a little bit about um, how Deming's ideas paint um, a picture of a knowledge city. So a knowledge city, in fact, exhibits many of the principles of Edward Deming's system of profound knowledge. The system is rich with natural variation. The knowledge village is a place where knowledge conversations happen every day, all day, and among everyone. All types of knowledge are valued from the highly credentialed to everyday knowledge. So we want to step back and consider what this actually looks like and how it functions every day. So the focal point for a knowledge city is not its technologies, not its built environment or its technology infrastructure, but its people, its households, its communities, and its organizations. A knowledge city is one in which people are engaged in robust knowledge transactions, whether it's on a street corner, in a supermarket, at work, or in their neighborhood. It's, um, uh, it's one in which everyone engages in knowledge moments and knowledge conversations. Um, I would um, highly recommend to you the writings of two individuals, Peter Cook and Ron Devere. They've created an image of a knowledge city as a collage of interconnected knowledge moments and interactions um, as seen from the perspective of an individual, the household, the community, and the organization. So this is a little bit of a fuzzy image. I do apologize for that. It should be a little bit clearer in the PowerPoint slides. But these are just images that I um, extracted from Cook and Devere's work. If you look at each one of these images, you see some kind of a, a group activity that's taking place in a city that provides an opportunity for a knowledge exchange, for a knowledge transaction. And this is a much better, in my view, this is a much better representation of what a knowledge city looks like than the highly um, architected technology cities of the future. The one main difference is that what you see in those earlier images are buildings and uh, technology grids, and what you see in this image, the central entity in all of these images is people. So according to Ron Veer, a knowledge moment is a spontaneous or a planned human experience in which knowledge is discovered, created, nourished, exchanged, and transformed into a new form. And I've given you um, a reference to um, that um, chapter in Carrillo's book. The concept of a knowledge moment is central to Mark McElroy's knowledge life cycle and also to Nanaka's Seki model. So each of those cells in the collage that we just looked at represents a knowledge moment. If you stop to look at a week in your life, you could probably paint your own collage of knowledge moments. So in terms of, if we look back to some of Deming's ideas and his hidden principles, 
a knowledge city um, has um, has a, an aspect of quality and quantity, continuation and definitely a heartbeat, planned and spontaneous activities, breakthroughs, and it also has historicity. So in terms of quality and quantity, it's all about the quantity and the quality of knowledge flowing through the city, creating opportunities for knowledge exchange. And what I mean by this is um, people in all, um, at all levels of economics, um, in, of economic classes in the city, um, of all uh, different social um, classes. For example, if you looked at the city in Ohio where my grandparents raised their family at the beginning of the 20th century, they went to the same church that some of the major politicians in Ohio went to. Um, there was a very, there was a much greater mix of wealthy middle class and uh, lower, um, lower economic class individuals. There were many more opportunities for knowledge exchanges across those different segments of the city. There are also continuous opportunities to gain, engage in knowledge moments and encounters, daily, weekly um, events. There are planned and spontaneous activities. Both of these are required to create a vibrant knowledge city. There are breakthroughs. Um, making the breakthrough from an industrial city to a knowledge city is really very important. We have to think a little bit more chaotically. We have to be open to spontaneity, et cetera. Historicity. Um, this is a really interesting aspect to me. Many elements of the early cities, say the early 1900s, um, may have a greater resemblance to a knowledge city than the high-tech cities that we're trying to build today because those early cities supported citizen engagement, one-on-one um, -on -one engagement. Um, there's also a, a greater sense of humanity and the life of the city if you look at it from that um, knowledge moment perspective. So a knowledge city has roots. They have a history, they have legacy, they have tradition. Culture, we know, is really critical to knowledge management, and there's no reason why culture isn't as important an element in a knowledge city as it is in a knowledge organization. We need to have multi-generational households, multicultural households. All of these are critical to generating um, knowledge gaps, so we realize that there's something more we need to learn, and to encouraging learning. We need to have a future orientation. We need to move towards a vision of the future, thinking about how to solve today's problems with better solutions for tomorrow. There needs to be an identity. We need to be creating identity around knowledge, the knowledge of the inhabitants so that everyone can buy into this new identity. Governance, we need to have strong and visionary leadership grounded on knowledge-rich decisions and deliberations and extensive participation. It also needs to be multifaceted. Knowledge is a part of every citizen's everyday life, and I think this, the knowledge city recognizes that. And we need to have different scales and levels of knowledge activities. We need to have knowledge activities at all levels, not just the high-scale professions or the high-value positions. Okay. We need to have dynamic flows, rich networks of connections, vibrant and growing knowledge networks, and I don't just mean the um, technology networks, but these will ensure that there are knowledge flows among all the citizens of the city. We need to be inclusive. Everyone engages in knowledge transactions, not just the CXX folks or the intellectuals. If we're only focusing on the highly skilled in our organizations and our businesses, we're not going to have a sustainable knowledge environment. We also need to think about speed. Faster knowledge cycles and flows um, should be expected due to the level of engagement and activities. Expertise and experience. We need, to convert, um, we need to think about the conversion of existing knowledge stores into knowledge actions. How much um, knowledge and expertise and experience lives in our cities now that we're not tapping? 
We also need to have transformation of existing places. So we need to enrich our existing places where people congregate with knowledge rather than um, create new places. And the collaboratories are very important, but why not use some of our existing places to build collaboration? Architecture is another important aspect. Um, the design of a city determines the flow of knowledge to some extent. Where cities are designed around strip malls, where they require driving, where there are few uh, places for p community to gather, you're probably going to expect low knowledge flows. If I'm um, walking um, to a neighborhood a store, I'm probably going to meet my neighbors along the way. I'm going to talk to them. If I'm, if the only place I can go uh, to find a supermarket is driving five miles away, I'm probably, the only people I'm talking to are the people are, that I probably am reaching on my cell phone. So local, it needs to also have both a local and a global focus. So a knowledge city is part of a network. It becomes part of a larger system of knowledge transactions and flows. So flows are horizontal in their network. They're not necessarily up to the state or the district level. Another element of a knowledge city is there needs to be, there need to be serious opportunities for play. Child's play, game nights, online games, gamification of decisions, city sports leagues, public play spaces are all important to social context. I don't know if you all have noticed, but I find that the minor league or the city uh, sports teams are, seem to be regaining popularity um, as places where people gather and engage with one another. I like to um, observe when I'm driving. Um, I spend a lot of time on the road, so I, I like to observe neighborhoods to see whether there are any children outside playing and interacting, learning social skills. Um, I look for advertisements in community for open game nights or in some in places you may have a, uh, an open sports field and people will just come together to play soccer. They may not even know one another, but they know that there is a game scheduled that night and they can join in. All of these um, kinds of activities provide opportunities for knowledge transactions and knowledge exchanges. Obviously, conversations and dialogues are the most important element of the city. That's the most atomic level of a knowledge flow. No knowledge city can exist where there are no conversations. So all conversations are important as well. Okay, so I'm not sure if you're all buying into my vision of a knowledge city um, or to Cook and Devere's um, vision of a knowledge city. But how do we get from here to there? So in some ways, it might actually be like going back in time to achieve the future. So how do we transform our cities today to living systems? Well, getting from where, from where we are today to where we want to be tomorrow is not a trivial task. It requires a fundamental shift in how we think of ourselves and our roles in the city as a system. So as knowledge management professionals, I think we must apply our theories and practice to the whole environment, not just to the eight to five business environment. And we can't think about this as only something we study. It has to be something that we live. We need, to tra uh, we need actually transformational leaders to help us accomplish this. And that's one of the reasons why I'm going back to look at um, Deming's work, because um, he, he talks a, a about a lot of these issues. Um, and I would also like to suggest that we define the term leader here fairly loosely. We need leaders at all levels. So at some, in some way, everyone in the city is a leader, whether at the household, the community, the group, or the organization leader. So Deming has issued, Dem, many years ago, Deming issued a challenge. Um, to um, knowledge city inhabitants. Essentially, the challenge we face is to translate the, the principles that Senge and Deming and others have um, shared with us. We need to translate those principles into practice. We need to increase our awareness of what it means to be a transformational leader and 
essentially how we each do this each day. So um, at the beginning of the uh, presentation, Jake mentioned that I'm the knowledge, the uh, Goodyear Professor of Knowledge Management at Kent State. And one of the things that we're doing is we're including these ideas in our knowledge management curriculum. So we have designed a new course for the fall, Knowledge Cities for a Knowledge Society, as a one credit course, which we're offering to our students to help them think about how they're applying what they're learning in the master's program to everyday life. Okay. So we'll also, um, we're also bringing these ideas into our course on uh, the economics information and also on knowledge economies and knowledge economics. Um, we'll, some of the methods, some of the characteristics that we just discussed of a knowledge city um, are indicators in the new knowledge economy index. Now we're still working out the the individual indicators, how we capture them, and how we develop the integrated index. But we're going to start doing research um, on this topic and collecting and experimenting with data. So as I've studied Deming's work over the past few years, I've come to see that his concept of leadership is not limited to people who are in positions that have the title manager, director, officer, or president. Each one of us has to be a knowledge leader. It means that I have to do more than talk about Deming's work or teach it. It means that I have to live it and become a practical living example of the theory. So what does this do to my day? It means changing from a follower and a consumer to an everyday leader and a creator. What does my day look like in a knowledge city? What are the knowledge moments that I generate? How do I encourage others to create and engage in knowledge moments with me and with others? And how do we break out of a lot of our follower and fear-based culture? I think these are all issues that, as a knowledge professional, I need to think about consciously every day. So we've formulated a new set of indicators that more closely align with how we think a knowledge economy really behaves. It's, a knowledge economy is different than an advanced industrial economy. And while we all want to move towards an, an advanced industrial economy, we also need to blend that with a knowledge economy. So we have quantitative indicators that are designed to be applied at the city level with a focus on individuals, households, communities, neighborhoods, and organizations. We also have qualitative indicators such as observing and experience um, and looking at the, the occurrence and intensity of knowledge moments. Um, we would welcome research collaboration with any communities that are also interested in this, or we simply like to have advice as we move forward. So our intent is to apply this new methodology to the nine major cities in the state of Ohio. Um, so um, we're capturing a snapshot of each of the cities in the morning, the afternoon, evening, and late at night. We're observing moments in specific places, such as restaurants, shopping centers, libraries, city hall, churches. We're observing individuals, all age groups, across cultures, across occupations. And we're observing processes across actors and moments. In other words, city governance and decision making, neighborhood activity planning, legal and judicial processes, business activities. To give us a better understanding of what a knowledge city looks like and how it behaves. Okay, so let me tell you something else um, that Kent State is doing to um, support the development of knowledge cities, and that is to establish a center, which we hope will be a model uh, for other centers around the country, essentially providing knowledge extension services to communities. So we can look back to the agricultural economy to see how we used agricultural extension services to spread knowledge, support research, and facilitate adoption of new practices. So we think that what we need to help us move into the knowledge economy at a society level, at a city level, is a network of knowledge sciences centers, just like we had um, in when we were moving into and improving the agricultural economy. 
So moving society to the knowledge economy means addressing all five of those areas that we talked about earlier. And remember our environment, economic system, societal regime, civic context, and human development. So what we're looking at in terms of our Knowledge Science Center, um, we think it should provide learning and teaching. It should provide advising, advocacy, and research and development. One of the things we need to be aware of is that while everybody in a, while everyone in a city needs to be aware of and move into a knowledge economy um, way of thinking and behaving, not all communities, organizations, small businesses have the resources to do that. So we believe that it's important for academia to step up and help um, wherever possible. So this is one of the um, goals of the Knowledge Sciences Center. So we see the constituents of a Knowledge Sciences Center as including the academy because, you know, a lot of knowledge management um, stems from practice, not necessarily from theory. So the academy needs to learn from, um, the, from practice. Uh, the academy needs to learn from private and public sector, needs to learn from technology industry. So we also see the private and public sector as a major constituent, the workforce that is trying to adapt to this new economy. Civil society, we believe, plays a very important role in um, the new uh, view of the knowledge economy, and also the technology industry. So. An open question which we want to explore, um, let me step back just a moment. In the next um, month, you will probably see um, announcements for a series of webinars. These will be on Wednesdays at lunchtime. Uh, we're going to be posing questions on how the um, Knowledge Sciences Center should um, function, who it should serve, what its intellectual property rights should be, what should the engagement model be, what kinds of services should it provide. So um, we're, we're going to ask for, uh, we're going to provide an opportunity for open discussion of these questions and we're going to be soliciting your input and advice. On September 4th and 5th in Canton, Ohio, we will be sponsoring a two-day Knowledge Sciences Symposium. And you'll see that uh, the website for that as well shortly. On September 10th and 11th, we'll be repeating the symposium um, activities in Washington, D.C. at the Department of Transportation Library at the Navy Yard. Um, so we would welcome your participation in either of those events, the um, in-person events or in the webinars. So the goal of the center is to serve a community and to grow the knowledge sciences field. So we want to hear everyone's ideas and we hope you will feel free to contribute to the dialogue. We want the center to be one that reflects the needs of a community and engages in knowledge cities and their growth. So thank you very much for listening today and I hope this all made some sense. If there are any questions, discussions, and please feel free to always disagree. Disagreements are great because they provide opportunities to learn something new and to think about something differently. <laughs> Thank you, Denise, for uh, definitely a whole lot to uh, take in at once. Well, if no one has any questions, I'd be happy to take emails um, offline or, oops, we have a question, okay. Um, yeah. So Patricia um, has shared some ideas, um, and it's a really good question, actually. 
Um, Patricia is wondering, um, she likes the idea of knowledge moments, but she's wondering about social media and how it makes interactions more virtual and often impersonal, and how this meshes with the concept of knowledge cities. That's a really good question. Um, and it depends, I would say it depends on um, who you're talking to, who you're engaging with in knowledge cities. You know, I've often seen people standing next to one another texting each other. And um, I don't know if, you know, that's, a, I suppose that's a knowledge moment, but it could as easily be handled perhaps by a conversation. So, um, yeah, I agree with you. I think we need to look seriously at things like um, the social media and how it may be contributing to, in some ways, the decline of knowledge neighborhoods or knowledge cities. It's a really good point, Patricia. I think if we look at a knowledge city as one that's technology rich and enabled, we would tend to overlook that whole question. So it's um, important as well. Patricia, go ahead, please. Yeah. I'm sorry. Can, can, you, can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Okay. This one, it was going to be harder to type. Okay. So I, I just wanted to share with you an observation um, that really struck me as you were talking. Um, I live in the, in the uh, Washington, D.C. area, and there is this, there was this old movie theater, and it couldn't compete with some of the new movie theaters. So they demolished the area, and they're train, trying to create a town center. It's now called the Mosaic District. And um, they have all these shops. There's a movie theater. And recently when I went there, they, they've put an outdoor area, they have water park, kind of little players for the kids, but for some bizarre reason, they put up this massive TV screen. And it just struck me, looking at it, it's like here was an opportunity to maybe have one of these gathering places, and instead, right. there's this huge TV screen, and they're just showing like random TV shows, and it, it just boggles my mind what concept, what they're trying to get at, um, you know, with that screen. It's almost out of like a 1984 or something where randomly, I, anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you because it just seems so counter to you know, what it is you're talking about. Very interesting, very interesting. That would be a very interesting case study to actually just observe what's happening in that area and whether or not the, the screen is actually distracting people or preventing them from interacting, because obviously, if it's if it's got sound, it's overpowering all of the conversations that are happening. But I know you're in the D.C. area, so um, so you may want to go out there. It's up on Route 50. It's near the Dunmore Metro Station, called the Mosaic District. But you might want to oh. check it out sometime and see for yourself what you think is going on. Absolutely, it would be a great place to do. Um, the observation. If you're planning to take either the economics of, of um, information or the the new one credit course in Knowledge Cities in the fall, let's let's think about um, let's think about taking that as a place of observation. Okay. Wonderful. Great comments. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for coming today, and um, I'd love to start some more conversations about this. If you have some suggestions for other places we can partner, oh, one thing I forgot to mention is um, I retired from the World Bank a couple of years back, but I still work with folks at the World Bank. And what was really interesting when I started working on this, I went back to them to tell them that I think that they need to redefine the knowledge economy index, and I was. Not, I was expecting a not very positive result to that, but instead what they suggested to me was, yes, they knew this because some of the, the countries around the world were not pleased with the Knowledge Economy Index. It's not actually measuring knowledge um, activities. And what actually resulted from those conversations is now a potential research collaboration between cities in Africa, Latin America, um, the Balkans, and the United States, looking at actual knowledge cities 
regardless of the larger economic systems and actually focusing on the city as an economic um, entity. So that may be really interesting. Well, thank you all very much. I think I will stop talking now. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Jay. All right. Bye, everybody.